Thank you, Martin. Uh, I'm Gérard Carcenti. I'm from Columbia University, and it's my pleasure to introduce an old friend of mine, Jans Brüning, who is director of the Metabolism Max Planck Institute in Cologne, and the title of his talk is CNS-Dependent Control of Integrated Physiology. Jans? Thanks, Gérard, and um, thanks, Martin, for the kind invitation. It's a really great meeting, and great opportunity to really meet real people after two years, and so it's a true pleasure being here. So I, I have to apologize straight up that I really don't work on aging research, so that's a, my disclosure to start out with, and, but maybe at the end I may mention the word aging where I think you know, the stuff that we're doing may be looked at in the perspective of aging and um, the aging uh, regulation of integrated physiology. So what our lab is interested in is really how the brain controls peripheral metabolism and how we got into this question was really the old model uh, that was proposed by Kennedy in the 50s who proposed that there would be feedback regulation of energy homeostasis by communicating factors which would tell the brain how much energy is available. And then he predicted that the communicating factors would have the receptors in the central nervous system, particularly in the hypothalamus, where feeding and many metabolism regulatory functions uh, are governed. And then uh, this would adapt accordingly food intake and energy expenditure according to the energy state of the organism. And that was a beautiful model put forth in the 50s, but it took another 40 years until the first molecular correlate of that was identified when Jeff Friedman from Rockefeller cloned leptin. And this really pushed open the door to trying to understand the neurocircuitry underlying body weight and metabolism regulation. And as predicted by Kennedy, um, leptin is exclusively produced by adipose tissue in proportion to lipid storage. So it's basically a, a fat sensor released to circulation and the leptin receptor is expressed in the hypothalamus. If you take a mouse, inject leptin into the brain, it will potently suppress feeding and promote energy expenditure. And the question then was, I mean, having in hand the tool of, um, of leptin as an entry point to, to the neurocircuitry, it became very rapidly clear through work from many, many groups in, um, across the globe what the primary targets of leptin action are or what very important and evolutionary conserved mediators of leptin effects are. So these are highly specialized energy sensing neurons which reside in a specific region which is termed the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. And there are approximately three to 5,000 cells which are characterized by the expression of a specific neuropeptide which is called pro melanocortin or POMC. And so POMC neurons become activated when energy stores are full. So when leptin activates them, or also insulin, as, as we've shown. And then when energy stores are full, alpha MSH is released, acts on downstream neurons, and potently suppresses feeding. And this is why those neurons are called anorexigenic food intake suppressing neurons. However, right next to those, in the same anatomical localization, another group of neurons resides, which under the microscope looks completely alike, but they do the exact opposite. Those cells are activated under conditions of starvation. They express another neuropeptide, which is called a GUDI-related peptide, AGRP, and they are inhibited by insulin and by leptin. So they do the exact opposite. And once they're activated, they promote voracious feeding. And so this is why they are called orexigenic food intake promoting neurons. And so we set out approximately 15 years ago to really test the fundamental role of these neurons in, in adult mice. And what we decided to do is to ablate those cells in adult animals, and we took uh, advantage of the trick that mice are completely insensitive to the bacterial toxin diphtheria toxin because they don't have a receptor for it. And if we express the human diphtheria toxin receptor on either cell population and then inject diphtheria toxin within 24 hours, we can just ablate the cells. And the result was pretty, pretty impressive. So what, um, what Eva Grob, the postdoc doing the work, found is when she ablated those 3,000 cells from the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, which express AGRP, the animals massively reduced feed intake. They rapidly lost body weight. And if you would let the experiment go, the animals would actually starve to death. So it's really remarkable that you have 3,000 cells which are necessary for the maintenance of feeding and survival. 
And this is not just an unspecific reaction to killing cells in the center of the hypothalamus, because if you ablate the neighboring POMC neurons, the animals do the exact opposite. They slowly start eating more and they gain more weight. So this really highlights a fundamental functional antagonism between those two fitting regulatory uh, neurons. The next point that we were interested in was the notion when we had knocked out the insulin receptor from the brain, that the animals exhibited a reduced ability to suppress hepatic glucose production, which is somewhat counterintuitive. If you go back to your biochemistry textbook, what you will find is that the insulin receptor is expressed on hepatocytes and that insulin released from pancreatic beta cells binds that receptor and suppresses hepatic glucose production. However, what we had demonstrated is if you only remove the insulin receptor from the brain, still having the insulin receptor in hepatocytes, the animals will lose the ability of insulin to suppress hepatic glucose production. And so we reasoned if those neurons, AGRP or POMC neurons, are so specialized to integrate the energy state of the periphery of the organism, could they also be potentially the mediators of insulin-dependent regulation of glucose metabolism? And so this is early work by Christina Koenner, at the time a PhD student in the lab. And what she decided to do is to knock out the insulin receptor either from the 3,000 AGRP or from the uh, 3,000 POMC seniors. And then she performed clamp experiments to investigate the in vivo ability of insulin to suppress hepatic glucose production. And so in control animals, insulin completely suppresses hepatic glucose production. If you remove the insulin receptor from the anorexigenic food intake suppressing POMC neurons, that doesn't change. But if you only remove it from the 3,000 hunger-activated AGRP neurons, insulin loses about half of its ability to regulate hepatic glucose production. So this really brings us to model that insulin action is not sufficient on the insulin receptor in hepatocytes to fully regulate peripheral glucose homeostasis, but that it requires the simultaneous action of insulin on those highly specified energy-sensing AGRP neurons. The drawback, if you wish, and this has been confirmed by many, many groups uh, subsequently, but that most of the studies were really hinging on experiments where, for example, the insulin receptor or downstream components of the insulin receptor had been knocked out throughout development. And so we really got interested in the question, how acutely can those neurons regulate uh, glucose metabolism potentially? And so this is work from Sophista Calorum, a very talented postdoc in the lab. Sorry, I have to just go back. And so what Sophie capitalized on is modern technologies in molecular systems uh, neuroscience. And what we can do now is that we can express G-protein coupled receptors selectively in cell types, let's say AGRP or POMC neurons, and the GPCRs have been mutated in a way that they do not any longer respond to endogenous ligands which occur in the mouse. So that basically the, it's an inert receptor to anything that circulates in the mouse, but it can exogenously be activated by an artificial ligand which is called clozapine anoxide or CNO. And so Sophie asked, can the acute chemogenetic activation of AGRP or POMC neurons regulate peripheral glucose metabolism? And this just highlights you that the system works. So the uh, chemogenetic receptor is expressed in AGRP neurons. That's what they look like in the acute nucleus. And if you do patch clamp recordings from those neurons, they're firing at their basal rate. And as soon as you wash in CNO, they start firing. So this really gives you remote control over molecularly defined subsets of neurons and also in vivo because you can also inject CNO and it will act exactly the same way. And so what, what Sophie then asked, does the acute activation of those neurons affect glucose metabolism? And the answer is yes. So just activating those 3,000 AGRP neurons and then performing in glucose tolerance or an insulin tolerance test revealed that this was sufficient to impact glucose tolerance and insulin sensitivity in the animal. So really showing that this is not some weird chronic adaptation or weird phenomenon, but that it's really the minute-to-minute -minute regulation of this neuronal activity, which strongly impinges on uh, peripheral glucose metabolism. And for the sake of time, I just want to share one concept with you, 
which is a study that's also fully published, and this is why I'm not going to go into great detail, just summarize the concept. It's worked by Klaus Brandt, super talented postdoc, who is now an independent group leader here in Copenhagen. And what Klaus realized is that the AGRP and POM C neurons, and he didn't find that. That was first published by Zach Knight. What you would have predicted, if the hormonal regulation is the only regulator of those neurons, you would predict a certain kinetics with which those neurons would be regulated. In other words, you would expect you eat, energy stores get filled, leptin levels go up, and then leptin should act to suppress AJP neurons and to stimulate POMC neurons. But actually what Zach Knight had found and what we had confirmed is that if you monitor the activity of those neurons in vivo, actually the POMC neurons start firing and the AJP neurons get inhibited the moment the animal sees and smells the food, even before having taken the first bite. And then if the animal doesn't get the food, that activation transiently tempers off. And so what Klaus asked, what could be the role of this sensory perception dependent regulation, transient regulation of POMC and AJP neurons? And I refer you to the paper, but what, what he really delineated, I think, in a series of extraordinary complete experiments was that the sensory food perception transient activation of the food intake suppressing POMC neurons regulates sympathetic nerve activity subserving the liver. This activates mTOR signaling and initiates a specific transcriptional program of the unfolded protein response which remodels ER homeostasis. And the way we look at this is that probably this is in place to prime the liver for what will happen very likely, because if the animal sees and smells the food in, in a freely behaving wild animal, that would mean it will be in your body shortly later, and thereby you prime liver metabolism by increasing protein folding capacity, rewiring lipid metabolism. And so I took all those introductory slides to basically leave it with a concept that we're most fascinated about, is that we have those very specific neurocircuits, very well defined, and they literally integrate all information about the energy state of the organism. They respond to leptin, they respond to insulin, they respond to ghrelin, which is released from the stomach in fasting. They directly sense nutrients, such as glucose and lipids. So they're really the optimized senses of the energy state of the organism. And then, I hope I've convinced you, they not only regulate how much energy you will take up from outside of the body, but also how you shift energy from internal sources and regulate the internal energy production. Because we could also show that they control lipolysis. They also control innate immune responses, bone mineral density, and through ascending projections to the brain, mood, and as I've shown you in the last example, also proteostasis. And I think this is what I would see is potentially an aging relevance pathway that if you lose that optimal integration of adapting all those responses in accordance to the energy state, that then really uh, a whole body homeostasis gets hairwired. And I just want to share with you over the last six and a half minutes uh, an unpublished study, which I think is we are also really interested about. So the classical view is that the acute nucleus is a privileged side with a leaky blood-brain barrier, different from the rest of the brain, which would make sense because those neurons have to sense what is going on in the periphery. You can view them as the antenna of the brain, you know, checking what's going on in circulation. But it's not that there is no blood-brain barrier, although it's more leaky. And so what, what the structure really looks like, so this is the median eminence, this is the arcuate nucleus, the structure I've been talking about where those POMC and AGP neurons reside, but still the hormones have to get from the vessels into this region. And what is very special about this median eminence uh, blood band barrier is that there is a certain cell type uh, of specialized radial glia cells which line the third ventricle, and those cells are called tenocytes. And they extend protrusions both to the vessels and also into the brain parenchyma of the neighboring nuclei. So it has been proposed that the tenocytes are really a critical determinant for the access of circulating factors into um, those neuronal regions. And one has to say, despite you know, many studies over the last 20 years, the mechanism of insulin transport to the central nervous system uh, has not been elucidated yet. 
So there was an idea that it's insulin receptors on endothelial cells of the blood-brain barrier which may control the insulin uptake via transcytosis. And so uh, Marta Pranesha Kumar decided to tackle that question genetically. And so what she decided to do is to knock out the insulin receptor selectively either from the tenocytes or specifically from the blood-brain barrier vasco-endothelial cells and ask the question, which of those interventions or any does affect brain insulin action, particularly in the arcuate nucleus? And so what's shown here is an animal injected with insulin peripherally. You see very little phosphor AKT signaling, which is a pretty typical signal molecule downstream of the insulin receptor kinase. And then you see a rapid activation of AKT phosphorylation in the tenocytes lining the third ventricle after five and 10 minutes. If she knocks out the insulin receptor selected selectively from the tenocytes, insulin loses its ability to activate AKT signaling in the tenocytes, which I think yeah, makes sense. But is also interesting, if we put animals on a high-fat diet and make them obese, as it has been described in peripheral tissues, also the tenocytes seem to become insulin resistant, so insulin loses its ability to activate AKT signaling in the specialized radial glial cells. And importantly, this not only affects insulin signaling in the tenocytes, but also in the neighboring neurons of the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. So peripheral insulin injection activates AKT signaling in neurons of the arcuate nucleus, and this is largely reduced in animals which lack the insulin receptor in tenocytes, uh, as well as in high-fat diet, fat, obese um, animals. In contrast, if she uses a genetic model, I'm not going to go into the details here, to selectively remove the insulin receptor from the vascular endothelial cells of the blood-brain barrier, she can successfully do this. She can abrogate insulin-induced AKT activation in the vessels themselves, but this has absolutely no effect on the ability of insulin to activate signaling in the arcuate nucleus. So really providing the first evidence that it's insulin receptor expression on the tenocytes, which is required for insulin to act on the neurons, but not in vascular endothelial cells of the blood-brain barrier. And since we hypothesized that this may be a consequence of reduced insulin transport, we directly assessed this. And so the animals were at this time injected with uh, fluorescently labeled insulin. And you can see in the control animal, fluorescently labeled insulin accumulates in the tenocyte in the neighboring neurons. And if you have a knockout of the insulin receptor in the tenocytes, you lack accumulation of the fluorescent insulin in the tenocytes. And there's a clear reduction in insulin transport to the arcuate nucleus. So really providing direct evidence that insulin receptor expression in the tenocytes is required for uh, efficient insulin transport. What happens now physiologically with the animals, just to cut it short, uh, consistent with a phenotype of impaired insulin signaling in, in the brain, we see a, a mild increase in body weight and the development of insulin resistance uh, in those animals. And then again, we performed those euglycemic hyperinsulinemic clamps, and as we had shown for the insulin receptor knockout in AGRP neurons, also, the tenocyte insulin receptor knockout loses the ability to suppress hepatic glucose production, and there's a clear reduction in insulin-stimulated uh, glucose uptake into brown adipose tissue, both functions that we had previously linked to the activation of AGRP neurons. So really, in line with the notion that insulin doesn't reach the cells, the phenotype is pretty much recapitulating the lack of insulin action in the medial basal hypothalamus. But what is interesting is that the defect is not only limited to insulin. Uh, the opposing force on AGRP neurons are ghrelin, is ghrelin. So ghrelin is re released from the stomach under conditions of starvation. If you inject ghrelin that potently uh, induces feeding in control animals through activating AGRP neurons, but in the tenocyte insulin receptor knockout, the ability of ghrelin to activate feeding is virtually abolished. So really indicating that the, the, the process is probably not only linked to insulin transport, but that it seems that the lack of insulin signaling in tenocytes compromises a broader range of functions governed by those neurons. And this is exactly what we wanted to study in greater detail. And what Marta developed, I think, is a really cool system. She used two recombinators, Cre to knock out the insulin receptor from the tenocytes, and a different recombinase, DRI, 
to express a, a calcium sensor in AGRP neurons. So now we have control animals which have a calcium sensor in AGRP neurons or mice lacking the insulin receptor in tenocytes and expressing a calcium sensor in AGRP neurons. And then we can implant, as you can see here, um, a fiber to perform a fiber photometry to monitor online in vivo in freely behaving mice the activity and dynamic regulation of AGRP neurons in mice which either have or don't have the insulin receptor on the tenocytes. And what this really shows is this dynamic regulation in refeeding control mice potently suppress AGRP neuron activity, ghrelin stimulates activity, serotonin inhibits AGRP neuron activity, and also CCK, cholecystic kinin, also reduces AGRP neuron activity. And all of those physiological regulators of those critical energy state communicating neurons show an attenuated response once the insulin receptor is removed from, from the tender sites. And then we performed ribosomal profiling experiments comparing uh, insulin receptor tenocyte knockout to high fat diet induced obese animals and basically find that there is a coordinate dysregulation of mitochondrial stress response in the tenocytes uh, under both conditions. And so really to summarize, I hope I've convinced you that the melanocortin neurons comprising both AGRP and POMC neurons coordinate the adaptation of integrated physiology to the energy state of the organism. AGRP neurons mediate insulin's ability to regulate hepatic glucose production and brown adipose tissue glucose uptake through the CNS. In addition to the hormonal feedback regulation, they integrate the sensory information to prime anticipatory physiological responses, including proteostasis in liver. Uh, insulin receptor expression in tenocytes is critical for insulin access to, to the arcuate. Obesity causes insulin resistance in tenocytes, and insulin resistance and obesity-associated alterations in tenocyte function affect AGRP neuron regulation across a wide range of physiological regulators. And therefore, we think that you know, studying tenocyte alterations also in aging as in obesity may be a promising way to define new mechanisms for altered central control of peripheral integrated physiology regulation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jens. Uh, other questions from the audience? Hello. Yes. Great. Uh, yeah, super exciting work on the, uh, especially the first part I found very interesting. And I wanted to ask, um, how specific is the neuronal sensing and then priming of the you know, metabolic uh, response mm. uh, before, um, to the food that they, um, so if you only give lipids or if you only give glucose or protein? Well, so, so first of all, the sensing uh, primarily depends on olfactory perception. Uh, what Zach Knight has shown is that if you go give highly palatable food, the, the calcium response is stronger than you just give chow pellet. But uh, to say that the, the, the ingredient doesn't even have to be there. I mean, you can hide the pellet, and as long as the animal can smell it, it will drive the activation of the neurons, which I think is pretty impressive. And so we're currently really still trying to understand the exact nature of the signal, the circuitry of the signal, um, but, I mean, this is all I can tell you as far. But it, it responds to a wide array of uh, nutrients, either the ones that they have learned before or even which they were naive to. I have one question, yes. Sure. Uh, the inhibition or the lack of inhibition of gluconeogenesis uh, in the tannocyte knockout is as potent as in the... Uh, AGRP neurons, yes. As potent? Yes. Okay. If not even stronger, I mean, we're really, but, but I mean, the clamp techniques have a little bit changed, yeah, but it's yeah. pretty much the same. It's as if they don't respond, and I think it's pretty much in line with the calcium imaging data. I mean, hardly there's any response, mm -hmm. and also the ghrelin effect is completely wiped out. So there must be something, and I think it's not only transport. I think there's a fundamental communication at the end. Tenocytes are glial cells which communicate, for example, through release of ATP, through purinergic receptors. So I think there might be room for really direct uh, glial neuron interaction, which completely rewires a set point for activation of those neurons. And I think this is what we're trying to figure out right now. One more question. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Just shout. <laughs> 
So as discussed many times in this meeting, dietary restriction yes. has all sorts of uh, benefits. So to what extent do you think that ad libitum fat mice are overdosed in uh, food sensing and therefore an overdose in the UPR? Yes, um, so I, I, I think um, a, as long as it's uh, a normal diet, I think they're fine to maintain that as, as long as they stay on a regular cycle. We are, um, I mean, we're looking at all of this. So uh, the, the in intriguing hypothesis we have is, of course, that if you get obese, that also the sensory regulation falls off and that then the nutrients hit an unprimed liver and then that leads to you know, exaggerated accumulation of unfolded proteins and, and deterioration of, of liver function. However, we haven't seen that in high fat diet fat mice. However, what we have seen, and that's not published, is that the response completely wears off in aged mice. So in old mice, they lose literally the ability of the sensory perception to drive uh, proteostasis in liver, which I think is completely consistent with many, many data. And, and, and I think it's not a simple mechanism. We, we've been done calcium recordings in young and old mice, and the, the ability of the POMC neurons is different to respond to the sensory perception. But even this, uh, uh, the sympathetic innervation of liver changes. And so I think it's a combination of different factors contributing to the dysregulation of this you know, anticipatory priming. And, and therefore, I think it may well contribute to aging issue. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.